Welcome to Talks at Advent, homilies and reflections given at the Church of the Advent, a Western Rite Orthodox mission in Atlanta, Georgia. All right, so we are uh, recapping all of the church history that we have looked at so far in the last several weeks. It's been a long time. That we've been doing history, it seems like uh, we've been pretty in-depth in a lot of it, so I'm going to try to um, just hit the highlights and give uh, an overall impression of 2,000 years of church history. Uh, we'll break it up into centuries, so 20 centuries anyway. We start, we'll start with the first century, obviously, um, and the first century begins as the first century in the middle of time. Um, and I was just reading something today. That today, uh, September 1st, is the Orthodox New Year. Uh, and in September 1st, there, this was also kind of a tradition that uh, the world began basically sort of, you know, in, at the beginning of September. Um, the idea was that it began about 5500 B.C.-ish, uh, just by the old Hebrew reckonings and, and whatnot. So... So the idea that the world was just going on, they were numbering sort of the, the years of the world. Uh, they called it the Anno Mundi in Latin, the, the world year, and they were counting these down. But eventually, um, in the Christian world, we started counting based on the Incarnation, when, when God came into the world. And now we count Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, instead of the year of the world. <laughs> so, um, why do we count in the year of our Lord? Well, because the Incarnation changed everything. The whole world is centered around the Incarnation of God in the world. So that's why, in talking about church history, if we start in the first century, we start at the birth of Christ. So, the first century begins with Christ's birth. And we have the entire life of Christ, obviously, culminating in his death, resurrection, and ascension. And then sort of the beginning of the church era, we are talking about church history now, um, we generally say the church sort of begins on Pentecost. Again, theologically, you can say that the church uh, began at the foundation of the world. Um, but in, in, the, in the world, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, is enlivened by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And so there we have the beginning of the church era. So in the first century, we have the apostles, the, the, uh, those sent out by Christ into the world to uh, bring the good news of salvation to all the world. Uh, the tradition that they carried with them this is what St. Paul refers to when he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, the first century is begun with the life of Christ, um, the church is birthed at Pentecost. The apostles go out into all the world spreading the gospel, but not only spreading a simple message that God has come to the world and you can be saved, but also spreading all of the implications of that, the way to live, the way to worship God because of that, what we basically call Holy Tradition with a capital T. This is all going out into the world in the first century. The second century. <clears throat> The, the you know beginning of 100 AD, uh, we have the rise of the persecution of the church, um, especially under Emperor Trajan. Those martyrs because of these persecutions. Uh, there were several saints that we know of, including Ignatius of Antioch, whose letters we have, Polycarp of Smyrna, whose letters we have, and also uh, we have an account of his martyrdom. Saint Justin Martyr, we have his letters and writings. Um, also, Justin Martyr was one of the first sort of philosophical apologists, uh, wrote, wrote apologies, which is a Greek word meaning defense of the Christian faith. He addressed one famously to the emperor himself. He also wrote against various heresies, Christian heresies. There were already people in the church preaching different doctrines. We won't get into those right now. We'll talk about other heresies in the centuries to come. Uh, but he wrote against those. He wrote against... Judaism, distinguishing Christianity from uh, the old traditions of Judaism, he wrote against paganism as having been a pagan philosopher himself. Sometimes he's also known as Justin the Philosopher. 
We also have letters from Clement of Rome. We have the letter to Diognetus, uh, whose author is anonymous, but is a fascinating letter from the second century. Uh, we have the letter of Barnabas. We have the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve. We have a uh, writing called the Shepherd of Hermas, writings from Melito of Sardis, and of course from Irenaeus of Lyon, who was uh, a Greek bishop in the uh, city of Lyon in uh, Gaul or France. Uh, he was also martyred. We have in those letters and writings indications about church order, the way that the church was set up, especially in her, um, her ordained roles. So we see most definitely the threefold sort of set, set up of bishops, presbyters or priests, and deacons. Um, several letters, especially the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, uh, describe this setup. So one of the big things, uh, another big theme in a lot of these letters and writings was the carrying on of tradition, the tradition of the apostles. They emphasize that um, we are, the true church is that church which carries on the traditions that the apostles gave us. And so we see examples of what the Eucharist was like in these writings. We see uh, the fact that Christians were meeting on Sundays and not Saturdays to celebrate as their primary uh, day of meeting. We see rules about fasting, about uh, various things like baptism, and other indications about the life of the church in the second century. And a lot of those are in, uh, well, they, they're all actually in perfect sync and harmony with the current Orthodox Church of today, and in contradistinction to the life of a lot of other Christian groups. Um, there, there are clear deviances of Protestant and other Christian groups and sects that don't line up with the life of the church that we see in the second century. And that was one of the things that uh, convinced me so much of, of the historic faith as, as we see still lived out in the Orthodox Church today. So in the third century, we see the church growing, especially after there are two emperors, uh, Decius and Valerian, who um, instituted empire-wide persecutions against Christians. Well, after Valerian died, all of this persecution was kind of halted for a little while, and the church grew by leaps and bounds during this uh, early part of the third century, growing to perhaps as much as 10% of the entire population of the Roman Empire. Cyprian of Carthage was a notable saint in this time, defending uh, the forgiveness of what was called the lapsed Christians, those Christians who under those persecutions uh, renounced their faith, but then repented of, of that and wanted to come back into the, the life of the church as faithful Christians. Cyprian said that these, these Christians, if they're sincere in their faith and, and truly sorry for their lapsing, uh, do deserve to, to be forgiven and come back. This was not what uh, some in, in Rome, especially a guy named Novation, wanted. He started this <clears throat> pure church because they wouldn't allow these lapsed Christians to come back in. Cyprian of Carthage said, no, um, you need to not go into schism. You need to not leave out Christians, and you need to stick with the church of the apostolic continuity. Don't go into schism because of this. Uh, there were a lot of occasions for possible schism in the, in the church, and, and most of the saints were the ones fighting for everyone staying together, but not compromising the faith in the process. Uh, this was the beginning of the first sort of school of theology, Christian theology in Alexandria. Notably, the, the leader of this was Oregon, or Origen, depending on your pronunciation. Um, and he called on the learning of the Greeks to aid your faith. He, he thought that the, the philosophy of the pagans, um, wherever it was true and good, uh, should be an aid to faith, not something that we should set up against the, the Christian faith. In other words, to be a Christian, you don't have to let all of the other learning and wisdom of the world go out the window. Um, you can be well-rounded and and reasoned and have a faith uh, that is that's strong uh, without having to do away with or get rid of all the other wisdom that came before you. So a lot of development of doctrinal language started happening in this um, in this century. Not the development of doctrine, but the development of doctrinal language. <clears throat> Lur uh, liturgical life uh, in this century can be found in two works, and spe uh, specifically the teaching of the apostles, a work coming out of Syria, and apostolic tradition by Hippolytus of Rome. And in these 
uh, we see um, amazingly full descriptions of the baptismal and chrismation services, of ordination services. We have our first entire um, Eucharistic prayer uh, preserved in, in text from these sources. And that brings us to the 4th century, the 300s. Um, Emperor Diocletian was ruling Rome at the beginning of the 4th century, and he instituted an empire-wide persecution that lasted from 303 to 306. This, was, this produced the longest list of martyrs that we have. Uh, this was the most intense period of persecution that the church had seen. When Diocletian abdicated the throne, there was a bit of a who was going to take over the emperor's seat. Um, Constantine, as we know, ended up winning out, and he won one of his primary battles for, for to be the emperor. And on the eve of battle, he had a vision where he saw either a cross or the the Kiro symbol, you know, the the first the anagram kind of uh, for the first letters of Christ's name. And accompanying that symbol, the words, in this sign, conquer. And so the story is that he had all of his army paint this symbol on their shields and, and uniforms. They won the battle. Constantine then uh, legalized, once he became emperor, legalized Christianity and ended persecution. He himself wasn't actually baptized until his uh, deathbed in 337. After him, Christianity was actually officially uh, made the religion of the empire uh, by an edict by uh, Emperor Theodosius in the year 380. In the 4th century, this is when we see the first sort of major heresy that started tearing the church up internally. And this was propagated by a man named Arius. He said that Christ, the Logos of God, was not truly God, that he was only um, a creature, that he was the most exalted of creation, but a, a creature nonetheless. The first ecumenical council held in Nicaea was called in 325 to deal with this, and it condemned Arius' teaching. But the heresy called Arianism now persisted, and um, the second ecumenical council, uh, called in 381 and held in Constantinople, ended up affirming the first council, and it also declared the Holy Spirit divine as well. Not inventing, like saying, okay, now we decide that the Holy Spirit was divine, but saying, this is always what we've believed. We're defining it officially now as an entire group of, of bishops um, who have the freedom for the first time to do this and meet across the world um, because we couldn't do that when we were under persecution. So that's, that's how that works. Um, and so the combined statements from these two councils, Nicaea and Constantinople, produced what we now call, in short, the Nicene Creed. Properly, it's the nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but it's the creed that we say every Sunday. It also sort of recognized uh, the five major patriarchates uh, or the five major cities and centers of Christianity in different regions of the world. Um, Rome was the largest and had the first honor because of its apostolic um, sort of authority in the tradition of Peter and Paul both having been martyred there um, and Peter setting up his, his um, rule there. Constantinople following this because it was the imperial city and there was obviously it was now this, the, a center of Christianity. Antioch in the region of Syria, Alexandria in Egypt, and Jerusalem, of course, the place, uh, the birth of Christianity. Um, some notable saints coming out of the 4th century were Athanasius the Great, um, the Cappadocians who were uh, Basil the Great, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their friend Gregory of Nazianzus. John Chrysostom, uh, was during this period, Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Nicholas, St. Nick, um, St. Ambrose. This was also the beginning of the monastic movement. St. Anthony the Great famously sort of pioneered uh, desert monasticism, seeking to escape sort of the, um, well, he was called to the desert to do battle with his own flesh, with uh, the forces of evil, and he had many disciples that came out to him, and then they started this monastic movement where Basically, the balance is um, solitude, where you do battle with your own flesh and with the devil, and also a degree of communal living for support and receiving the sacraments and so forth. Some other um, notables in the monastic movement uh, from this era, uh, era were Ephraim the Syrian, who wasn't really a monk, but he, he lived like a monastic. Uh, St. Jerome in the west, St. John Cassian also in the west, and Martin of Tours. Um, in the region of, well, now France. 
All right, so in that century we had uh, the legalization of Christianity, two ecumenical councils, the birth of monasticism, and some of the most notable saints the, the church has. So the 4th century, that's a big century. In the 5th century, um, a man named Nestorius refused to call Mary the Theotokos, which is a traditional name for her by this point, meaning God-bearer, because he said that the, the person born to Mary was the man, Christ, and not the Logos, or the Son of God. He said that the Son of God, the Logos, would come to dwell in this man, who is, who is the Christ, but that he wasn't born. He, he was God who dwelt in this man. Cyril of Alexandria would have none of this. He denied this teaching vehemently, saying that the eternal Son of God became a man by the Virgin Mary, by her very by taking of her flesh. Thus, she is properly called the bearer of God or the mother of God. And that's why we call her the Theotokos or the mother of God, because she truly was the mother of God. It was God in her womb. Cyril held a local council in Ephesus, basically one that he called and controlled to affirm this teaching and to, and to deny uh, Nestorius' teaching. This council was later affirmed by a lot of the Eastern bishops and thus called the Third Ecumenical Council in 431. Nestorius' teachings uh, persisted, though, and so the Fourth Ecumen Ecumenical Council was called in 451. It defended Cyril's teaching, uh, relying heavily on a letter from Pope St. Leo of Rome, declaring that Christ is one person in two natures. His person, hypost hypostasis, um, has two natures, or physis, God and man. Those are his two natures. And as God, he is of one essence, or homoousius, with God. And as man, he is of one essence, or homoousius, with humanity. So this, these two natures in one person is called the hypostatic union. The so-called monophysites were sort of fanatical followers of Cyril, um, who rejected the council's two natures definition, saying it contradicts St. Cyril's earlier writing, which only speaks of one nature in the incarnate Christ. Well, the Orthodox claim that their teaching is the same as the Holy Father, Cyril's. It's just more precise. Cyril didn't need to use this language when he was writing to argue against Nestorius, but later they developed this language. And so the two sides have been in disagreement and schism ever since. Uh, this is what we call the Monophysite Schism, and these churches are now the Coptics, the Ethiopians, uh, Syrian Jacobites, the Syrian Church of India, and the Armenian Church. Now, again, we know that there's been a lot of discussion between the Orthodox and the um, non-Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, and it seems like a lot of the disagreement had to do with semantics and language and not so much doctrine. So there's, there's been a lot of good stuff in regards to the um, relationship between the two churches. So, um, the 6th century, the Emperor Justinian made the relationship with between the, the state and the church a little closer than it had been. Um, he actually was very involved, you could almost say controlling, with the life of the church. He convened the Fifth Ecumenical Council um, to condemn essentially a lot of weak attempts to heal that monophysitism schism. You know, it, people were desperate to sort of heal this schism because it, it did take out so many um, people from the church and so he called uh, a council to condemn a lot of weak efforts to essentially gloss over the schism, to pretend like it wasn't a big deal, and to invent new language to make it all work, and uh, a lot of things that were just not, not great. So the Fifth Ecumenical Council condemned a lot of these things. It clearly defined the person and natures of Christ in his incarnation with a lot of very long uh, statements about who Christ is. It also condemned Origen posthumously because of perceived teachings of his and later followers of his who were over-spiritualizing everything from the scriptures to the tradition and, and everything, uh, very problematic. So Origen is not a saint, even though he is one of the most prolific and influential writers of the early church. And he wrote a lot of really, really good stuff. He also just had a few um, not great ideas and uh, was a sinner like the rest of us. And so the church doesn't recognize him as a saint uh, but it does recognize his contribution to uh, the early church and, and its development of its uh, language. The Emperor Justinian during this century built the great church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, 
Um, a lot of the codification of the Eastern liturgy happened during this century, largely because of the uh, influence of Constantinople in sort of uh, everything it was doing in, in its imperial church in the city there. A lot of uh, what it was doing sort of was exported to the rest of the Eastern Orthodox areas. A lot of hymns were written during this time. In the West, St. Gregory the Great, Pope of Rome, he wrote a lot of really terrific stuff also. Um, uh, some of the, uh, his writings called the Dialogues in the East. He's known as St. Gregory the Dialogist because of his writings. He sent St. Augustine of Canterbury, well, to Canterbury, um, from Rome, and had him um, essentially convert the, um, the Angles and Saxons in lower in southern England. Um, we know that uh, Christianity was alive and well in a lot of Celtic areas of the north of the British Isles, but the pagan Saxons were uh, largely evangelized by St. Augustine of Canterbury. St. Benedict of Nursia set up his monastic community, um, which would become highly influential in the West. Um, this is also the first time that the Filioque was officially added to the creed in the West. It was added in a council in Toledo in Spain. So locally, but from there it started growing in popularity um, in, in the Western world. So in the 7th century, an idea called monothelitism started spreading around the East, which was the doctrine that Christ only had one will or energy. So um, this idea was popular, you know, because it might be seen as a way to reconcile those who thought that Christ had two natures and those who thought that Christ had one nature in his incarnation. Um, well, maybe we could say that he has two natures, but only one will. Well, this was also opposed by Maximus the Confessor and also Pope Martin of Rome at the, at the same time um, because they, they said that if Christ has two natures, he can't have one will. Two natures require two wills. And to say that he only has one will is still a way of mixing his two natures, of um, mixing them up so that he's not fully God and fully man. Something is, is lost if you only have, if you only give him one will. And so they said that because of the, the ecumenical council and the tradition of Christ's full humanity and full divinity, we have to say that he also has two wills or two energies according to his two natures. Um, but that his human will is perfectly subjugated by or his human will submits to his, his divine will, which is the same as the will of the Father. That's why in the garden he can pray, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, my human will, but thy will, which is also his divine will. Freely submitted, yeah. Um, it's not that his divine will uh, subjugates, I think I used that word, but that's too forceful. Um, it's that his human will is freely submitted to his divine will. Both Maximus the Confessor and Pope Martin suffered greatly um, for their defense of Christ's two wills and energies. Um, Maximus the Confessor called the Confessor because he was, as he was confessing this, was mutilated and tortured uh, by the imperial powers, who really desperately wanted to put this whole Monophysite schism behind them. So there was kind of, kind of a, a worthy goal here, but... It was done probably through evil and not good, which is, of course, why they ended up torturing two saints of the church because of this. So eventually, near the end of the century, in the year 680, the Sixth Ecumenical Council was called and affirmed the teaching of Maximus and Pope Martin. This was also the century of St. John of the Latter, or St. John Climacus, a monk who wrote a very influential writing uh, called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. Um, in the East, he has his own Sunday in Lent dedicated to him and, and the teaching that he expounded, which was basically a, a, a description of the Christian, well, the monastic life, but really the life for all Christians, um, a way to renounce the world, renounce our um, passions, and to submit ourselves to God and to gain virtue. This century, the 7th century, was also the birth of Islam in the East, so in the 8th century, after Islam had taken root and spread and begun building its own empires, 
St. John of Damascus, who actually worked for the court of a Muslim uh, sultan. I don't know if they had sultans then. I'm not sure the title of the ruler. But anyway, John of Damascus, a Christian um, in Damascus, was uh, working under and for a, a Muslim ruler. But he was a Christian who wrote a strong defense of icons, which were under attack at this time in, in this century. We know the iconoclastic heresy sort of sprang up, and John Damascene, John of Damascus, wrote a defense of icons, saying that icons are justified, not only justified, but are laudable, and, and we should paint and venerate icons because God came into the world and became visible. God became a man. And he says, since God became depictable, we ought to depict him. <laughs> um, when God wasn't depictable, he couldn't be vis visualized, and so you couldn't make an image of God. But once he became a man, you can make an image of him, and you can venerate that image because your veneration passes on to God himself. And so depictions of God in the person of Jesus Christ and of his saints were already a feature of orthodoxy, but once they became challenged, those orthodox Christians who remained orthodox, icons became even more important uh, after that point because of uh, this satanic impulse to tear them, tear them down and destroy them. So in the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, called by the Empress Irene, icons and iconology were officially affirmed. In the West, uh, the rise of the Carolingian rulers in France, and uh, especially Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, at the end of the 8th century, in the year 800 on Christmas Day, uh, he was actually crowned the Holy Roman Emperor um, in Rome. And he was able to do this, invent a new empire, basically, by attacking, basically, the credentials of the Eastern Empire. One of the things that he attacked was that the East had said the creed without the filioque, which by this point had reached France, and which either knowingly or unknowingly he thought was, um, or he said was the way the creed originally was, and so the East had taken it out. So it's unclear if he knew that the filioque was added later, or if he didn't know that and he actually thought that that's the way the creed was in the first place. Either way, he chose that as one of the things to attack in the, in the uh, East, he also was a little bit misogynistic and said there's a woman sitting on the throne in the east and so the throne is vacant, <laughs> so I get to be emperor. Um, but at the end of the day, all these attacks against the Eastern Empire were just excuses to have his empire in the West, um, which in one sense is kind of a good thing for the West because it was basically a mess of unorganized, half Christian, half pagan, half Aryan, I know that's three halves and that doesn't mathematically add up, but whatever. Um, you know, different little kingdoms here and there. And so the West was really just floundering. It was in the midst of, basically, this is what we call the Dark Ages. Um, and so the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire was the beginning of a more solidified West. The idea, basically, of Europe was born at this, at this point. So this is the beginning of the 9th century now. The Holy Roman Empire is formed, Charlemagne sits on the throne, and he uh, Christianizes, he, he takes a lot of uh, the traditions of Rome and applies them to his churches in, in uh, Gaul and France, and his empire begins to spread in power and authority around the Western European area. So in the ninth century, Cyril and Methodius are sent from the east to uh, be missionaries to the Slavic people. In 808, Pope Leo III reacted against Charlemagne's affirmation of the filioque, interestingly. And he said, no, that is not the way the creed goes. And he was so adamant about this that he emblazoned golden tablets with the creed on them in, their, in its original form and hung them on the doors of St. Peter's in Rome. So that was an affirmation of the original creed. Unfortunately, uh, the Pope... Uh, directly after, or two popes after him, ended up affirming the changed creed with a filioque. Uh, this was Pope Nicholas I, so that's a bummer. <laughs>
Uh, this was the point of the Phocian Schism, which I won't get into. I'll just reference it. But it basically was the first sort of official schism between a pope in Rome and a patriarch in Constantinople. And this uh, was eventually healed. Uh, patriarch Phocius <clears throat> and Pope Stephen ended up reconciling and everything was cool for a while. But um, it did live in the memory of East and West and this uh played a role later in the Great Schism. In 842, the Empress Theodora ended officially the icon controversy. She basically stamped out everyone else who was fighting against the icons, and the, the procession of icons through the city of Constantinople in the first Sunday of Lent in the year 842 um, became the yearly feast of the triumph, not only of icons, but of everything that they represent, that of Orthodox Christianity. And so in the East, the first Sunday of Lent is still known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy, and there's always a procession of the icons around the church. At this point in history, a lot of the Eastern liturgical practices were really sort of codified and solidified in their current form. Um, the, the typicon, or basically the way of celebrating the liturgy, of a certain monastery near Constantinople called the Studion Monastery became normative basically for the entire Orthodox Church eventually. Uh, this, this monastery held a lot of sway in its monastic poetry, which became, it became part of the liturgy for the entire Orthodox Church. This was the Studion Monastery near Constantinople. So in the 10th century, this brings us up to the 10th century, the Great Lavra of Mount Athos was founded in the 10th century. This sort of opened the way to the development of the Great Monastic Republic of the, the Mount, Holy Mountain known as Athos in Greece. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, wrote his influential treatises on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in Christians. This was in, in 1022 is when St. Simeon died, but he... Uh, is writing just amazing stuff about um, the Christian life and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's pretty wonderful. Church and state continue to move closer together in Byzantine society. <clears throat> we see some liturgical development. We see some things about uh, marriage. This is the first time that the rite of crowning as a separate marriage service, apart from the concepts of the divine liturgy, um, in which marriages were previously performed as a sacramental action of the church. So... A marriage ceremony is now kind of its own right in the East. We have a king in Kiev who essentially sends out um, emissaries to decide, hey, what religion is our new great empire in Kiev going to be? And um, he received, he ended up receiving the Christian faith a la Constantinople instead of Rome, uh, which by this point, even though they aren't in schism, are different enough to have sort of distinct... He didn't just receive Christianity. He received Byzantine Christianity. And so you, you, see, you see how different East and West are at this point. Um, even though they are still technically not in schism, they are now, you know, technically under different empires. They recognize themselves as, well, the East might have still thought that the West belonged to it in terms of government and empire, but they had no practical governance control over the West at all. So the West was governing itself under its own sort of empirical empire. So in the West, uh, in the later 9th century, uh, this was a dark period. New waves of invasions destroyed the relative security created by Charlemagne. The church suffered from the domination of uh, a lot of smaller kings again. Communication of the East was virtually cut off. There was a Western Reform Movement that began in the Monastery of Cluny in France. The Reform Movement, among other things, brought the general practice of clerical celibacy and a powerful, centralized Roman papacy. This moves us to the 11th century. This, of course, was the great, this, the century of the Great Schism. So there's a lot of details about um, the, the politics at play between the papacy and you know, what was going on in Constantinople. But basically, there was another personal schism between those two cities. But unlike the Phocian schism of earlier, this was never healed. And this went on to essentially affect 
the divide between East and West um, altogether. So it's not like the Great Schism was one, you know, immediate schism between all of the churches in the West and all the churches in the East. It was just between Rome and Constantinople. But eventually, everyone in communion with Constantinople also sort of cut off communion from Rome and vice versa. And so you have what's birthed as the distinction of the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. The First Crusade happened in 1095, and by the way, that was in um, 1054. In 1095, the First Crusade happened. No one in the East doubted that the Pope of Rome was the emperor in the West. Um, they kind of had accepted that by this point. It was ultimately the Crusades which sealed the schism um, between the churches. The Crusaders took over Jerusalem in 1099, expelled the Muslims, and established a Latin hierarchy in place of the local existing Eastern Church order. Kiev in Russia began to grow as sort of its own power in this, in this era. It started producing its own saints. Anselm of Canterbury, who wrote his famous ontological proof for the existence of God, was in the West at this point. There was also Bernard, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He was an ascetic mystical theologian and activist. And some other saints. So that's, that's the um, 11th century in the Great Schism. In the 12th century, the uh, general advance of the Kievan sort of power, um, it began to expand and develop. It took over a lot more of what we call Russia now. It, it started sort of chronicling its own endeavors and its, its saints. In the West, together with the centralizing power of papal power, and the victory of the papacy over other secular rulers, the 12th century saw the rise of the uh, Victorine, uh, Victorine school of Augustinian theology led by Hugo and Richard of St. Victor. At this time, Peter Lombard wrote his influential sentences. Influential then, not so much now. The 13th century um, was the Fourth Crusade, which essentially a bunch of Western crusaders sacked Constantinople and set up their own churches. Uh, a guy named Thomas Morosini was named the Patriarch of Constantinople, um, and, a, and he was a Westerner. A Frank was named the new emperor. Um, <laughs> so basically a slap in the face to uh, a very violent and, and something not to be joked about or laughed about. It was a serious thing, um, something that the Pope in recent days has actually um, have essentially said we're very sorry for the sacking of Constantinople and in a wonderful gesture actually returned a lot of the artifacts taken out of Constantinople by um, crusaders, returned them to the Patriarch of Constantinople just this past century. But obviously this was you know, devastating. Unfortunately, that's not the only place the East was suffering. It was also suffering at the hands of the Turks in a lot of places, and a lot of Eastern bishops looking for relief from all of this actually uh, went to Rome. There was a council called Lyon in 1274, hoping to gain sympathy and military and economic aid for the crumbling empire. Uh, so the Westerners basically proposed that the East could keep all of their liturgical rights, but they had to, well, and the use of the word filioque could be optional as long as the doctrine that the West had come to believe about the filioque was professed. Uh, the Pope was, of course, to be recognized as supreme. So, essentially, all of the bishops rejected this and ended up going without the, the aid from the West. In Russia... The empire was continuing, had some fights with um, some Khans in Mongolia, but eventually they ended up reestablishing themselves. The 13th century in the West has been called the greatest of centuries um, by the West. Pope Innocent III succeeded in upholding the prestige and power of the papacy in the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, defined official doctrines of, of the Western Church. And a lot of these doctrines were just exactly what uh, Protestants and a lot of Eastern Orthodox think about when they think of 
the papal sort of idea. He basically said the Pope is always going to be a saint. If you're a Pope, you're a saint. Um, the, that Popes never err and never will until all eternity. Um, just said some, you know, pretty, pretty extreme things about the papal office. But we also had Francis of Assisi um, during this time founding his Franciscan order. Also, Thomas Aquinas was writing during this period. He died in 1274. He wrote um, some very influential things, especially in his Summa Theologica. We saw a few other uh, groups founded in monastic orders. Uh, St. Dominic founded the Dominican order. The Carmelite order, together with some other small religious groups, were formed. So in the 14th century, we have Gregory Palamas distinguishing between the essence and energy of God. This is because a Greek who was uh, a unit, which means he was in communion with Rome, he was a Greek named Barlam, uh, basically said that there were a bunch of monks who were attaining union with God through, um, through prayer, through a kind of prayer called silence, which is just a, a way of uh, trying to descend into the heart when praying. In other words, not be distracted, but truly focus all of your energy and attention mm -hmm. and love on God. And through this silent prayer, um, monks were saying that they actually were, were seeing uh, the divine light of God graced to them because of this. Barlam said that this is uh, impossible. You can't really have union with God. Gregory of Palamas said, oh yes, you can, and he distinguished between uh, what we call now the essence and energy of God, essentially that God is unknowable in his essence, but eminently noble in his energies. And we also in the West, you know, generally, um, the Eastern know of St. Gregory of Palamas in the West, in theological writings, this is basically the same thing has been called the transcendence and the imminence of God. God is both transcendent and imminent. Saint Sergius of Radonesh in uh, Russia was uh, during this time. He was uh, one of the greatest saints of all Russia, known for his holiness. Saint Andrew Rublov famously painted the, the icon of the Holy Trinity that everyone knows. It's actually the icon of the hospitality of Abraham to the three angels or strangers, but what the church has always interpreted is as a, a vision of the Trinity. His icon is uh, probably the best known of this, and, and the way he, he did it has been mimicked and has basically set the standard for depicting uh, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. In the West, we have people like uh, John Wycliffe, as the forerunner to the Reformation in England, printing out his Bible. Um, we have mystics like Julian of Norwich, Thomas Akempis, and others. We have the beginning of, um, almost the beginning of the, the Renaissance. We have Giotto, the artist painting in, in Italy. We also have Dante writing the Divine Comedy in Italian, not in Latin. Okay, in the 15th century, um, we have called the Council of Florence happened. At the Council of Florence, Eastern representatives accepted a strong papal power. Um, again, they were looking for aid because of the pressure of the Turks on Constantinople again. Uh, they were looking to the West to, to help them out. And they were so desperate at this point that they accepted papal um, infallibility, papal supreme power, uh, the doctrine of the filioque, and purgatory. All the bishops signed the union with Rome, except Bishop Mark from Ephesus. Um, he's the only one that didn't. So the union of Florence was not publicly uh, proclaimed until 1452 in Hagia Sophia. But then the next year, the Turks came in and took over the city, and that was the official end of the Byzantine Empire. 1453. Um, St. Mark of Ephesus, the firm defender of orthodoxy, has come to be called 
through him the unrighteous union and was canonized a saint for standing up against Rome. And so, of course, then uh, all subsequent bishops, Eastern bishops, denied the union with, um, with Rome in that council. Basically, when they had everything to lose or so they thought, they were willing to, to give it all up. But once they lost what turned out not to be everything, they decided, you know, that's not worth, not worth our faith. Okay, so yes, that, that's the fall of Byzantium. Serbia also fell to the Turks in 1459. Greece fell in 1459. Bosnia fell in 1463. And Egypt finally fell in 1517 to the Muslim Turks. The next 400 years, um, the Muslim Turks held sway over the Orthodox Christians in the former Byzantine Empire. So the Christians in the East, the former Byzantine Empire Christians, um, have been under the captivity of the Turks for, for 400 years until, until the 1800s. So this was, the 15th century was really sort of the, the high noon of the Renaissance in the West. We have the rebirth of, of Roman, the interest in, in ancient Roman and Hellenistic culture. We have artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. We have forerunners to the Reformation in the West, like John Hus, or Jan Hus, um, a Czech leader who was condemned and burned in the stake um, in 1415 because of his opposition to the Pope and the practices of the Roman Church. So, of course, Jan Hus already complaining about the Pope and the abuses of Rome would lead to the 16th century and the Protestant Reformation. Of course, we know about Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, and everything that happened after that. In the West also there was the Counter-Reformation, though. A lot of it was balanced. Some of it was over the top, like some Jesuits would later become. Jesuits were, of course, part of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius of Loyola in 1534. We had some mystics in the West, like Teresa of Avila, Francis de Sales, and John of the Cross. Palestrina was writing his beautiful, wonderful music, church music in this era. In Russia, there was the reign of Ivan the Terrible. He was pretty bad. This is when the uh, famous church in Moscow, in the Kremlin, uh, Church of St. Basil was built. Uh, not named after Basil the Great, the Cappadocian, but named after Basil the Fool for Christ, who lived in Moscow uh, during this century. He had a lot of influence. You know what the a Fool for Christ is? He was essentially, he lived like a beggar on the streets. He was, um, at first glance, just a, a crazy person, disheveled, begging for food. But there are, you know, numerous accounts of him prophesying telling you everything you've ever done in your life. His fame became so great that he would do this to, to the, uh, the czar, or the, the king in Moscow. So, the 17th century. We had the Old Believer Schism in Russia, which is essentially a bunch of Russians who refused uh, some reforms by the Metropolitan of the Church in Moscow. Some of those reforms were basically just to make Russian stand, liturgical standards more like other Orthodox liturgical standards, but there were some Russians who decided, you know what, nope, we have our traditions set and we're not going to do that. And so they went into schism. Very unfortunate. This is the century that Peter the Great became the Tsar. He violently attempted to westernize Russia, essentially changing all kinds of things, bringing in all sorts of Western customs, both in the church and in the state. Um, the old believers, in their desire to preserve the pure Orthodox faith and rituals, succeeded in uh, preserving, ironically, a lot of ancient Russian cu customs that would have been done away with if Peter the Great had his way. So, In the West, nations were recovering from the upheavals of the Reformation. America was being settled, of course. In 1611, the King James Version of the Bible was published. And by that time, what was it when they took out the, the apocryphal books? 
that was that was mostly um, Martin Luther who did that. That wasn't so much the. Um, yeah, I mean that was that was Martin Luther, when when he published yeah. his Bible in German, he removed all those because of the fact that he didn't have, uh, or or no one had. There there were no known manuscripts of any of those that were in Hebrew, um, so the the Masoretes, uh, a, a Jewish medieval sort of group of Jewish scholars, had put together. A grouping of books uh, which didn't include those books. Um, they didn't have Hebrew manuscripts at the time, and so Luther, because there were none in the Masoretic texts, left them out of his of his German Bible. Of course, he also wanted to leave out like James and yeah. Hebrews, and so, so um, problematic. Um, the first, actually, several. Um, Printings of the King James Bible, of course, had them. Um, it wasn't until much later that they started being removed from King James Bibles. Um, so that that brought us up to the um, that was the 17th century. Okay, so the 18th century. We're going to uh, go through these pretty quickly. Um, Peter the Great uh, ruled until 1725. Taking the title of emperor, he when the patriarch in Moscow died, Peter issued the ecclesiastical regulation, it essentially abolished the patriarchate of Russia, and it, it established the holy governing synod. So essentially, the czar um, of Russia did away with the patriarch, who is in Moscow, which is the way it should have been. That there ought to have been a patriarch over all of Russia, governing the local metropolitans and bishops and everything. Um, but Peter wanted to do away with this, and so he did, and he established just a group of, a synod, so-called, which included some bishops, but also some secular leaders, and of course, himself. So this this is how Peter took Russia into its Petersburg imperial, imperial era. At this time, though, Russians sent missionaries into Alaska um, in Kodiak. The first missionary party to reach the shores uh, was St. Herman, who was the first canonized saint of the Orthodox Church in America. So the first American saint is Herman of Alaska. Um, this is the century that John and Charles Wesley were uh, preaching. This was the Great Awakening era in Atlanta, uh, in America with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and, and others. Um, David Hume and Immanuel Kant were uh, developing their philosophies, which uh, were, were kind of removing God and elevating human reason. It became its own realm, human reason. It wasn't intricately connected to the rest of the world necessarily. This also reduced religion to sort of personal faith and pietistic devotion and ethics. It wasn't very holistic anymore. This Enlightenment philosophy was sort of the forerunner to liberal Protestant theology. When we get to the 1800s, the 19th century, this was the, the century of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Seraphim was a monk who, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little about, about him because he's so important, um, in Russia especially, but in Orthodoxy in general. He was a monk who spent 20 years in total seclusion um, in the most intense prayer, fasting, and spiritual exercise. He um, opened the doors of his enclosure, greeting the faithful who came to him with radiant joy. And his spiritual instructions identified the purpose of the Christian life as the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there are stories of Saint Seraphim and a disciple of his who, who was with him and witnessed seraphim glowing with the uncreated light of God, um, the same light defended by Gregory of Palamas in centuries before, and the same light as um, recorded in the Gospels with Christ and his transfiguration. So the Russians continued in their missionary activity, um, sending more saints across the Pacific to... Um, the Americas. In 1821, the Greek uprising 
caused the Turkish authorities to hang Patriarch Gregory of Constantinople and five metropolitans from the gate of the Farnar Inn on Easter Sunday. Um, after the independence of Greece was won, the autocephalous status of the Greek church was declared in 1833. It was confirmed by Constantinople in 1850. So Greece won its, um, number one, won its freedom from Turkey and also reestablished itself as a um, self-ruling church. Five self-governing dioceses of Serbian Orthodox, two dioceses of Romanian Orthodox were set up outside the boundaries of the Turkish Empire. This continued on. Any action of establishing a separate church administration on the basis of nationality, though, was officially condemned by the Patriarch of Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch as the heresy of philatism, philatism. In other words, saying, you know, now that all these groups are gaining their independence from uh, the Turkish Empire and setting themselves up, there was a temptation to say, oh, and by the way, you know, in, in their fervor for being sort of free and being nationally and ethnically independent again, saying that um, by, we're our own church. We, we are a Bulgarian church, meaning that we're, only Bulgarians are welcome. Well, that was officially um, declared a heresy, unchristian, and it was called philatism. In 1872. We, we know kind of about the ongoing Protestant development uh, during this time. Liberalism uh, started developing, also funda fundamentalism started developing, sort of this reactionary close your eyes, ears, and mouth, well not mouth, <laughs> but your eyes and ears, and um, sort of double down. Earlier in the century, in, in 1854, Pope Pius IX officially promulgated the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, something the Orthodox do not uh, subscribe to. In 1870, the First Vatican Council reaffirmed the doctrines of the Council of Trent and officially, for the first time in history, legislated the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope of Rome. So that had been written about and, and basically declared by a few popes, but this was the first council um, that declared and legislated the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. This declared that the, the Bishop of Rome has direct Episcopal jurisdiction over all Catholics in the world. In other words, e even a, a patriarch or a metropolitan would, would still, you know, not have direct jurisdiction over any particular Christian. That was the duty of their local bishop. Um, but now, the Pope not only has direct jurisdiction over those in his patriarchate, which was Western Europe, but basically over all Christians anywhere who are Roman Catholics, regardless of their bishop or cardinal or metropolitan or archbishop or whatever. And um, the First Vatican Council said that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra from his throne, on matters of faith and morals, his decision is binding on all Catholics since it is considered infallible. And it specifically says that the Pope can do this speaking from himself and not from the consensus of the Church. Very strong. In 1848, in response to um, overtures directed to the Orthodox by Pope Pius IX, the Eastern Patriarchs issued their famous encyclical letter in which the doctrine of the conciliar character of the Orthodox is clearly professed, signed by all the patriarchs of the Orthodox Church, together with 29 bishops fully endorsed by Metropolitan Filaret of Moscow, the encyclical letter of 1848 is held as the most authoritative document in modern Orthodox Church history. And this was written in direct response to Vatican I, basically. And this brings us up to this past century, the 20th century. Bishop Tikhon became the head of the Diocese of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, and Tikhon became Archbishop, um, basically, of, of all of um, America. So Archbishop Tikhon, during his time in America, met with several Anglicans, as we know, and he was approached and asked to uh, bless Anglicans to be Orthodox 
but retain their identity, their, their liturgical identity, their traditions. And so he sent, he sent off uh, a copy of the Book of Common Prayer to the Synod in Moscow to be approved, essentially. And, and Moscow sent it back with some alterations. And by and large, that's what we now call the Liturgy of St. Tikhon. That's what we uh, use, that's what we celebrate um, on Sundays here at this church. It was based on uh, basically an, an older text of, of the Book of Common Prayer, which itself was based on older liturgies, the Sarum liturgy, some, some Roman elements, and it's, it's overall, I mean, a very orthodox, it was already very orthodox, um, which is why all it took was the removal of the filioque from the creed, the addition of an explicit um, epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And that's basically, um, you know, essentially all the alterations that were made. And that's since been developed and, and approved by other uh, Orthodox, including the Antiochian Archdiocese. So we see um, Anglicans and, and other Westerners uh, becoming more friendly with the East, uh, in 1948, the World Council of Churches was formed in Am Amsterdam. By the time of its second assembly, the Patriarchates of Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch, the Church of Greece, the Russian-American Metropolia, and Romanian Episcopate in America had become official members of the World Council of Churches, uh, which is a way of saying, we will certainly talk with you. <laughs> We're not closed off to talking. Certain people like Vladimir Lasky played a very major role in ecumenical activity. So I should probably say that this was the time when uh, what we have now in America as the, the different jurisdictions were eventually formed. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, um, the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, which was basically the Orthodox Church outside of Russia in America. Um, and was blessed to be an American church by Russia. Um, but you had a, a lot of other Orthodox, like Greeks and Serbians and Arabs, Antiochians and everything. And so, of course, they were already here. So Russia didn't have authority by itself to say, hey, you guys who were our church, now that we're under communism, you go and be your own thing. Well, that doesn't mean that everybody's automatically under them, which is why the OCA... It's called the Orthodox Church of America, and yet we're not all under the OCA. But the Greek Church in America is here. The Antiochian Archdiocese is here, blessed by the Patriarch of uh, Antioch, um, and several others. And of course, there's a lot of work going on now to unify all of the Orthodox in America under one um, self-governing, hopefully, church. Um, so that's still going on. There's all, all kinds of other things we could talk about. Just in the past century, a lot of stuff has been going on in developments, but that's, that's more news than history, I feel like, almost still at this point. So we'll leave it off the history and say, that's a wrap. <laughs>